Chapter 3 Visionary Teachers and Scientists The great minds of the country had the ability to make others join their endeavor to convert dreams into reality. For them, the nation was bigger than themselves and they could draw thousands to act upon their dreams. In December 2000, I had participated in the birth centenary celebrations of Adhyapaka Ratna. I graduated in science from S.T. Joseph's College, Tiruchirapalli, 1954. As a young student, I saw Professor T. Iyengar, a unique divine-looking personality, walking through the college campus every morning and teaching mathematics to the students of B.Sc. Honours and M.Sc. The students looked at him with awe as one would at a guru, which indeed he was. When he walked, knowledge radiated all around. At that time, Calculus Srinivasan was my mathematics teacher. He used to talk about Professor Totadri Iyengar with deep respect and would organize integrated classes for first year B.Sc. Honours and first year B.Sc. Physics to be taught by him. I also had the opportunity to attend some of these classes, particularly on the subjects of modern algebra and statistics. When we were in first year B.Sc. Calculus, Srinivasan used to pick the top 10 students as members of the mathematics club of S.T. Joseph's, where Professor Totadri Iyengar used to give a lecture series. One day in 1952, he gave a lecture on ancient mathematicians and astronomers of India. He spoke for nearly one hour. The lecture still rings in my ears. Let me share with you my thoughts about some ancient mathematicians, glimpses of whom I saw in Professor Totadri Iyengar in my own way. Aryabhata, born in AD 476 in Kusumapura, now called Patna, was an astronomer and mathematician. He was reputed to be a repository of all the mathematical knowledge known at that point of time. He was only 23 years old when he wrote Aryabhatyam in two parts. The text covers arithmetic, algebra and trigonometry and of course astronomy. He gave formula for the areas of a triangle and a circle and attempted to give the volumes of a sphere and a pyramid. He was the first to give an approximation to pi as the ratio of a circle's circumference and diameter, arriving at the value of 3.1416. To celebrate this great astronomer, India named its first satellite, launched in 1975, Aryabhata. Brahma Gupta was born in AD 598 at Billa Mala in Rajasthan in the empire of Harsha. He wrote the Brahma Sputa Siddhanta at the age of 30. He updated works of astronomy. He covered progressions and geometry. He also studied and gave what is known as the solution of indeterminate equations of different degrees as well as solutions to quadratic equations. Bhaskara Charya was another unique intellectual of his time. He was born in AD 1114 at Vijalbada, located at what is now the border of Karnataka and Maharashtra. He wrote the famous Siddhanta Siromani in four chapters. He dealt with astronomy and algebra and is known to be the first recognized mathematician who evolved value to zero from the concept based on Aryabhata's discovery. To honor him, ISRO's second series of satellites was named Bhaskara 1 and 2, 1979 and 1981. The work of these three mathematicians of India provides the context of Albert Einstein's remark that we owe a lot to the Indians who taught us how to count without which no worthwhile scientific discovery could have been made. Then comes to my mind the greatest of all geniuses ever known and acknowledged who lived within our present memory, Sri Nivasa Ramanujan. He lived only for 33 years, 1887 to 1920, and had no practical formal education or means of living. 
yet his inexhaustible spirit and love for his subject enabled him to make a vast contribution to mathematical research and some of his contributions are still under serious study engaging the efforts of mathematicians to establish formal proofs ramanujan was a unique indian genius who could melt the heart of as rigorous a mathematician as professor g h hardy of trinity college cambridge in fact it is not an exaggeration to say that it was hardy who discovered ramanujan for the world why do not our reputed scientist locate another ramanujan in our schools oh my friends why don't you in every field integrate and grow instead of differentiating every integer is a personal friend of ramanujan one of the tributes to ramanujan said and it was no exaggeration professor hardy while rating geniuses on a scale of 100 put most of them in the range of around 30 giving a rating of 60 to the rare exception however for ramanujan he suggested only the value of 100 would fit there can be no better tribute to either ramanujan or to the indian heritage ramanujan's work covers vast areas including prime numbers hypergeometry series modular functions elliptic functions mock theta functions even magic squares apart from some serious work on the geometry of ellipses squaring the circle and so on i hope that eminent teachers who teach and inspire the young students of mathematics will continue their unmatched and noble services in the years to come thus ensuring the march of indian brilliance in this field professor s chandrashekhar the astrophysicist continued the indian mathematics tradition in his work abroad of course mathematics is universal now the tradition will further blossom with the efforts of professor c s sheshadhari professor j v narlikar professor m s narsimhan professor s r s vardhan professor m s ragunatham professor narendra karmakar and professor ashok sen among others sir c v raman started his career in the office of the accountant general calcutta but the scientist in him would not let him rest and he was always probing for answers to some of the problems that interested him fortunately he was supported by great educationist ashutosh mukherjee who encouraged sir c v raman to pursue his research it is noteworthy that the raman effect the discovery of which brought him the nobel prize did not come out of a grand establishment set up at vast expense i believe the urge to show to the world the excellence of indian minds would have been a major motivating factor for sir c v raman the same is the case with professor s chandrashekhar also a nobel laureate for his work on black holes there are some interesting statements in his biography chandra by kameshwar c wali as it points out chandra grew up in what was a golden age for science art and literature in india spurred on partly by the struggle for independence jc bose c v raman meghnath saha shrinivasa ramanujan and rabindranath tagore by their achievements in scientific and creative endeavors became national heroes along with jawaharlal nehru mahatma gandhi and a host of others possibly their great success helped produce an atmosphere of creativity howsoever it may be it is worth noting as chandrasekhar observed that in the modern era before 1910 there were no indian scientist of international reputation or standing between 1920 and 1925 we had suddenly five or six internationally well known men i myself have associated this remarkable phenomenon with the need for self expression which became a dominant motive among the young during the national movement it was a part of the national movement to assert oneself india was a subject country but particularly in science we could show the west in their own realm that we were equal to them 
Here I would like to quote Sir C V Raman who said in 1969 while addressing young graduates I would like to tell the young man and women before me not to lose hope and courage Success can only come to you by courageous devotion to the task lying in front of you I can assert without fear of contradiction that the quality of the indian mind is equal to the quality of any teutonic nordic or anglo-saxon mind what we lack is perhaps courage what we lack is perhaps driving force which takes one anywhere we have i think developed an inferiority complex i think what is needed in india today is the destruction of that defeatist spirit we need a spirit of victory a spirit that will carry us to our rightful place under the sun a spirit which can recognize that we as inheritors of a proud civilization are entitled to our rightful place on this planet if that indomitable spirit were to arise nothing can hold us from achieving our rightful destiny further afield there was similarly the emergence of others who were great in their respective fields interestingly a music trinity of great saints thiyaga raja swami ukal muttu swami dikshidar and shyama sastrigal also emerged at the same time in south india within a 50 km radius what we should note is that the movement for independence generated the best of leaders in arts science technology economics history and literature who stand with the best in the world in more recent times too we have seen the emergence of great visionary scientists particularly i was interested in the lives of three scientists dr d s kothari dr homi j baba and dr vikram sarabhai i wanted to learn more about their leadership qualities in the scientific and technological fields which helped link these to the development of the nation they are the founders of three great institutions drdo dae isro dr d s kothari a professor at delhi university was an outstanding physicist and astrophysicist he is well known for ionization of matter by pressure in cold compact objects like planets This theory is complementary to the epoch making theory of thermal ionization of his guru Dr Meghnath Saha Dr D S Kothari set a scientific tradition in Indian defense task when he became scientific advisor to defense minister in 1948 The first thing he did was to establish the defense science center to do research in electronic materials nuclear medicine and ballistic science he is considered the architect of defense science in india we are celebrating this great mind through a research chair at the indian institute of science dr bhava did research in theoretical physics at cambridge university from 1930 to 1939 homi bhava carried out research relating to cosmic radiation In 1939 he joined Sir C V Raman at Indian Institute of Science Bangalore Later he founded the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research with focus on nuclear and mathematical sciences He established the Atomic Energy Commission in 1948 His vision led to the setting up of numerous centers in the field of nuclear science and technology such as those for producing nuclear power or for research in nuclear medicine these science institutions generated further technological centers keeping nuclear science as the vital component dr sarabhai the youngest of the three had worked with sir c v raman in experimental cosmic rays he established the physical research laboratory at ahmedabad with space research as the focus In 1963, Thumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station began launching sounding rockets for atmospheric research. 
Dr. Sarabhai established the Space Science and Technology Center and was its director. His vision led to the establishment of ISRO with its allied centers responsible for development of launch vehicles, satellites, mission management and applications. These three Indian scientists, all of them physicists, started physics research institutions that blossomed into defense technology, nuclear technology and space technology, which now employ 20,000 scientists in centers spread around the country. One thing I noted was that all three realized the importance of making the political leadership understand what science could do for the country. It is essential that technologies that give immediate benefits to the people be taken up for implementation by the system regardless of which party is in power. Another important message conveyed by these scientists is that basic science is vital for growth of technology and for developing new leaders in science. Let us learn from them the proven qualities of leadership to value science and technology in an integrated way. In 1962, Dr. Sarabhai and Dr. Bhava were looking for a site to establish the space research station in the equatorial region. Thumba in Kerala was found most suitable as it was near the equatorial region and was ideally suited for ionospheric research. The locality, however, was inhabited by thousands of fishermen living in the villages there. It also had a beautiful church called St. Mary Magdalene Church and the Bishop's House. As such, the acquisition of the land did not move any further. Dr. Sarabhai met the Bishop, His Excellency Rev. Dr. Peter Bernard Pereira. On a Saturday and requested transfer of the property, the bishop smiled and asked him to meet him the next day. In the Sunday morning service, the bishop told the congregation, My children, I have a famous scientist with me who wants our church and the place I live for the work of space science and research. Science seeks truth that enriches human life. The higher level of religion is spirituality. The spiritual preachers seek the help of the Almighty to bring peace to human minds. In short, what Vikram is doing and what I am doing are the same. Both science and spirituality seek the Almighty's blessings for human prosperity in mind and body. Children, can we give them God's abode for a scientific mission? There was silence for a while followed by a hearty Amen from the congregation which made the whole church reverberate. It was indeed a great experience working with Dr. Sarabhai from 1963 to 1971. As a young engineer engaged in the task of composite technology, explosive systems and rocket engineering systems at the Tiruvananthampuram Space Center, I drew tremendous energy from his leadership. Though the nation was in its technological infancy, Dr. Sarabhai was dreaming of developing our own satellite launch vehicles. These would be used to launch from Indian soil, remote sensing satellites in sun-synchronous orbit and communication satellites in geosynchronous orbit. Today, his vision is almost realized with the launch of the geosynchronous launch vehicle, GSLV. ISRO has also operationalized the IRS and INSET systems, thereby bringing the benefits of space to the common man. There is an experience I would like to share with you in relation to Dr. Sarabhai's vision for space programs. I wrote briefly in Wings of Fire about this episode. The design project of India's first satellite launch vehicle was taken up at the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. The design of each stage of rocket, heat shield and guidance system was given to selected project leaders. I was given the design project of the fourth stage of SLB-3, that is the upper stage rocket, which would give the final velocity to put Rohini into orbit. This fourth stage uses an advanced composite material that provides high strength with minimum weight. It also has maximum loading of high-energy solid propellant. 
while we were developing the design of this upper stage in 1970 i received a call from dr sarabhai from ahmedabad stating that he would be visiting tiruvanthapuram along with professor hubert curian chairman of cnes the french space agency i was asked to give a presentation about the fourth stage to professor curian's team when the presentation was over we realized that the slv3 fourth stage was also being considered as upper stage for the french diamond p4 launch vehicle the cnes needed an apogee rocket motor nearly double the propellant weight and also size of the stage that we had designed a decision was then taken in the same meeting that the fourth stage should be reconfigured to match and suit both diamond p4 and slv3 i mentioned this episode because at the time this decision was taken we ourselves were in the design stage such was dr sarabhai's confidence in the indian scientific community development work on this stage started ahead of the other stages of slv3 with our motivation thus boosted work proceeded in full swing a series of reviews took place between the two teams and the fourth stage graduated from drawing board to developing stage unfortunately in 1971 dr sarabhai passed away and at the same time the french government called off the diamond p4 program once the fourth stage was developed and a series of tests was going on a new requirement appeared on the horizon in the form of india building a small communication satellite to be launched by the european ariane launch vehicle for the apple ariane passenger payload experiment communication satellite the slv3 fourth stage proved a perfect fit and it was included in the payload of the ariane launch in 1981 from koruo the french guiana the vision seeded in 1970 by dr vikram sarabhai was indeed realized when apple was placed in geostationary orbit and started communicating with the our earth stations apple success proved that a vision with committed scientific support will achieve its aim this achievement came as a fantastic fillip to the rocket technologist in the country the visionary may not be with us today but his vision gets realized the dream of dr sarabhai was shaped into reality by professor satish dhawan after he took charge of isro from 1972 Professor Dhawan structured and nurtured ISRO with a space profile and his work led to many significant accomplishments and benefits from a number of remote sensing and communication satellites. The Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle accomplished the feat of launching multiple satellites for India and other countries, injecting them in different orbits in a single mission. I learned an important lesson in management from professor dhawan when i was appointed project director slv3 in 1972 to design develop and launch the first satellite launch vehicle to inject rohini into near earth orbit this was that when a project director is appointed the whole organization including the chairman isro works for his success it is a lesson that has been of abiding value all through the other projects i have worked on the other thing i have learned after more than 40 years of working in three departments in various projects and programs is that you will succeed as a project leader as strong as you remember that the project is bigger than you wherever the project leader tries to make himself out to be bigger than the project the enterprise suffers I recall my working at ISRO headquarters Bangalore as director launch vehicle programs systems in the early 1980s when we were debating the performance and cost effectiveness of launch vehicles in 1981 the scientists of VSSC Thiruvananthapuram with the help of other ISRO centers evolved a configuration of the PSLV core vehicle with two large strap on boosters The PSLV weighed about 400 tons at takeoff. 
Professor Dhawan wanted to study an alternative and simple configuration. I and some of my colleagues A. Sivathannu Pillai, N. Sundarajan and K. Padmanabha Menon carried out mission technology and feasibility studies for the optimal configuration. The team designed several options including a unique core vehicle with an advanced solid propellant booster using first stage rockets of SLV-3 as strap-ons. This brought the PSLV weight down to only about 275 tons at takeoff. Professor Dhawan used to come almost daily to my small room which was close to his office and debate the possible configuration choice. He was himself a foremost aerodynamics specialist with mathematics and system engineering background and would illustrate his ideas on the blackboard and ask us to do more homework. We also studied the growth opportunities of PSLV with cryogenic upper stage as a GSLV and the possibility of launching due east geosynchronous missions. Professor Dhawan put the two most favored configurations up for discussion among the experts and the ISRO teams. Detailed examination and debate, taking the long-term plans into account, took place and they chose the PSLV configuration as proposed by my launch vehicle team. Professor Dhawan considered the future scenario of operationalization of PSLV and GSLV, bearing in mind the satellites and application programs and decided on this unique configuration and evolved the roadmap for ISRO for the next 15 years. I and Professor Narsimha brought out a book, Development in Fluid Mechanics and Space Technology, with Professor Dhawan's handwritten 15-year space profile based on the chosen PSLV configuration. A memorable day for me is 31st May 1982. Professor Dhawan gave me a send-off in an unconventional way. He called an ISRO council meeting to discuss the future launch vehicle program. I made a presentation to the directors of the ISRO centers on performance and cost-effectiveness of our launch vehicles and the growth profile. After the presentation, Professor Dhawan broke the news that he had given me to DRDO. This decision indeed gave me a change that led to progress in a different field. We see today's self-reliance in launch vehicle technology with PSLV operational and GSLV getting ready to be operationalized. This is close to the direction envisaged in the early 1980s by Professor Dhawan. The recognition of ISRO as a successful organization was due to the strong foundation and space profile envisioned by him. One test of leadership is also how well successors are able to carry forward a program. At ISRO, Professor U. R. Rao and Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan brought further success and glory to the organization. After his retirement, Professor Dhawan continued as a member of the Space Commission and in that capacity continued to help the organization which he built. Remarkably, Professor Dhawan saw the space missions envisioned by him come into being in his lifetime. He also saw in his lifetime many of those he had tutored emerge as strong technology leaders and themselves who have contributed immeasurably to the country. What a great personality he was. After joining the DRDO, I started the missile development program there. During the integrated guided missiles development program, the focus was to design missiles with state-of-the-art performance at the time of deployment. The surface-to-surface -surface missile Prithvi became the best in its class and uses delight with its high accuracy, reliable performance and the maneuverable trajectories. The first stage of SLV-3 became handy to configure Agni as a long-range deterrent. It blossomed from the REX re-entry program conceived by my team in 1981. Both Prithvi and Agni are in production and induction phase. Trishul, which is a surface-to-air missile, and Akash, once development is complete, 
will be contemporary missiles. The third generation anti-tank Nag will dominate as one of the best such missiles. In any aerospace or missile development program, delays are possible owing to the technical complexity of the work. But this should not deter us. The propaganda of foreign sellers and their associates in India should not dictate India's procurement decisions. My experience in dealing with the network of institutions that has been established is that our country has tremendous potential to develop the best technologies in this field. India could combat the MTCR very effectively, thereby proving to those who wanted us to fail that we can do it. Once we had developed competence in the design of missile systems, I looked beyond the IGMDP. The natural course of action appeared to be the supersonic cruise missile, which is essential in tactical warfare. Our association with one of the Russian institutes, NPO Machinostrania, developed into a partnership in the joint design and development of supersonic cruise missile system. This partnership is based upon friendship and equal competencies. I recall my association with Dr. H. A. Yefremov, Director General of NPO, an outstanding scientist of our time who had developed seven types of cruise missiles and inducted the systems in the Russian Navy, creating a joint venture between India and Russia in high technology projects in the prevailing situation in the 1990s became a complex question and a challenge to both Dr. Yefremov and me. Whenever I met Dr. Yefremov, I got the feeling of meeting a great scientist like Professor Satish Dhawan or Dr. Werner von Braun, the father of rocketry. Dr. Yefremov took me to his technology centers which are not normally shown to any foreigner. He truly treated me as a friend and arranged an Indian lunch in his laboratory. I took him to the research center, Imarat, an advanced missile technology center at Hyderabad. He was genuinely pleased to see the strides we had made. Our scientific minds merged and our friendship blossomed. We christened the joint venture as Brahmos a combination of the names of two rivers, the Brahmaputra and the Moscow. Siva Thannu Pillai was the natural choice as the chief executive officer and managing director of the joint venture, concurrently holding charge in DRDO as chief controller R&D for missiles. The dual role, an exceptional decision of the government, was essential to ensure the success of this venture. Venu Gopalan, an outstanding propulsion scientist from the Defense Research and Development Laboratory, became the project director. A new kind of joint venture came into existence, one which bridged the scientific community and industry of the two countries in design, development, production, and marketing of an advanced technology weapon. It was a source of great joy for me, as it was for the two teams. The first flight of Brahmos on 12 June 2001 from the interim test range, Chandipur was a milestone signaling the progress of the joint venture. The second flight on 28 April 2002 confirmed the results of the first and came as a great encouragement to our effort. Dr. Efremov and I are glad that both India and Russia have realized that this joint venture is the right way to bridge two friendly nations for building high technology weapon systems that could enter the world market. My dream of marketing an advanced weapon system ahead of the so-called developed countries will come true through Brahmos. Even though I am away from the scene, the team that I built was performed credibly. I am happy. I read a book titled an unfinished dream by the milkman of India, Dr. Varghese Kurian. He says in the book, It was my chance that I became a dairy man. But a British expert's criticism, the sewer water of London is 
bacteriologically superior to the milk of Pombe, served as a challenge to the young Korean who has taken daring from strength to strength over the decades so that India is the front ranker in milk production. On a visit to Anand, I had the opportunity to spend a day with him. As I went around the Amul establishment, I saw value addition at work. From milk, the cooperative has branched off to making numerous derivatives including butter, cheese and ice cream. These initiatives have given it the strength to be a major player in a highly competitive market. When I asked him what, in his view, was one sure way of launching the country on a growth trajectory, his answer was, you must build on the resources represented by our young professionals and by our nation's farmers. Without their involvement, we cannot succeed. With their involvement, we cannot fail. While talking about scientists, I recall my meeting with a medical specialist, Professor Kakarla Subha Rao, at the Indo-American Cancer Institute at Hyderabad. I asked him if cancer was some unmitigated curse. Yes and no, said the 77-year-old Albert Einstein Professor of Radiology. Yes, because we genetically inherit certain traits which make us vulnerable to cancer. No, because whether we get it or escape it depends largely on our immune response. Research into how the brain can influence immune response has given rise to the new field called psychoneuroimmunology. Findings in this field have brought great hope to people dealing with such difficult illness as cancer, AIDS, CFIDS, and other immune system related diseases. Other fields of research include psychoneurocardiology, the study of the mind heart connection, or psychoneurohematology, the study of how the mind can influence blood related disorders such as clotting problems in hemophilia such as the power of thought. These are diseases which normally require intensive treatment, but even here, medicine acknowledges that our minds can play a major role.